Lumen Gentium chapter 8 of the Second Vatican Council is really a beautiful overview of the truth about Our Lady in scripture and tradition and then coming forward in terms of applications for the church and the world today. And we're going to go through the elements of the Second Vatican Council on Our Lady, especially as she leaves her earthly life and takes on her new role as Queen of Heaven and Earth. Hello and welcome to Mary Cast. This is Dr. Mark Mirvali, Professor of Theology and Mariology at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. And my friends, it's a beautiful flow how this happens in the documents. Mary in the Old Testament, Mary in the New Testament, Mary in the work of redemption, Mary, you know, the climax of Mary's participation with Jesus in the work of redemption, and then the end of Mary's earthly life leading to the beginning of her celestial life. Lumen Gentium number 59, as we're going through the paragraphs of the Council, makes that connection between what happens to Mary at Calvary, where she's given as mother to all in the order of grace, and the continued role of Mary in the early church, but then her assumption into heaven. Number 59 tells us, uh, quote, But since it had pleased God not to manifest solemnly the mystery of the salvation of the human race before he would, be, before he would pour forth the Spirit promised by Christ, we see the apostles before the day of Pentecost persevering with one mind in prayer with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brethren. And, you know, John Paul II will comment that it's especially the prayers of Mary that call down the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Why? Because it's human spouse to divine spouse. Mary, the human instrument of the Holy Spirit, calling down the Holy Spirit as her divine spouse to bless the church at Pentecost. And that's, of course, what takes place. After the event of Pentecost, Mary is assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. Why, as the fathers tell us, because of her immaculate conception. They will say, finally, the immaculate virgin, preserved free from all stain of original sin, was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory. When her earthly life was over and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things, that she might be the more fully conformed to her son, the Lord of Lord, and conqueror of sin and death. So, with Lumen Gentium 59, we have completed Mary's earthly life. Old Testament prophecies, New Testament fulfillment, role in redemption, present when the Holy Spirit comes down at the definitive birth of the church at Pentecost, then her assumption. Now, my friends, now we can especially focus on the role of Mary as Mediatrix. And in fact, Lumen Gentium, this, this section of Lumen Gentium is entitled The Blessed Virgin and the Church. It's, it's the third section, major section of Lumen Gentium 8. But it really focuses on mediation. And number 60 is dealing with 1 Timothy 2.5. 1 Timothy 2.5 is the scriptural reference where uh, St. Paul says, and I quote, But there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The, the Council Fathers use this as a takeoff for explaining Mary's role because what they'll tell us is this. Mary's subordinate role to Jesus in no way takes away the one mediation of Jesus Christ. It's the opposite, my friends. It actually, as the Fathers say, it manifests the power of the one mediator. Now, what does that mean? Well, look, if you prayed for your mom and dad this morning, if you prayed for your children, if you prayed for the Holy Father this morning, you were a mediator. How so? You, by praying, participated in the one mediation of Jesus Christ. You did it in Jesus to the Father, but you participated in that one mediator. So don't think of Jesus as a mediator here and Mary's a shorter mediatrix and then there's St. Joseph a shorter mediator and there's all these little mediators. Think of one mediation and think of different levels of participation, one mediation. Think of one cable network, if you will, and different channels going through that cable network. Jesus is the one mediator, but Jesus wants us to participate, to cooperate in his one mediation. As I said, if you pray today, you did it. This is not a great mystery. And so Mary uniquely participates in the one mediation of Jesus Christ. This does not take away anything from the one mediator. It's rather the opposite. It manifests his power. So the more people that participate in the one mediation of Jesus, the more people are showing the power of Christ's one mediation. Mary like no one else. And so the fathers will say, but the Blessed Virgin's salutary influence on men originates not in any inner necessity, but by the disposition of God. That means 
God did not have to use Mary, but he chose to use Mary. And that's why we should choose to reverence and honor and love Mary with all our heart. Um, if you talk about what happens from necessity, there's very little because you've eliminated the incarnation, the redemption, your salvation and mine. None of that is necessary. Thank God it's his will. And it was also his will that God would come to us, that Jesus, the second person, God the Son, would come to us through Mary and that Mary would continue to participate uniquely in the one mediation of Jesus Christ. The fathers say, it flows forth from the superabundance of the merits of Christ, rests on his mediation, depends entirely on it, and draws all its power from it. So, the mediation of Mary is subordinate to the one mediation of Jesus Christ, but the more she mediates, the more the world knows they have a mother. The more the world knows they have a mother, the more they're drawn to the Son, who is the Christ. The mother is constantly trying to bring souls to Jesus, which is her God-given function and purpose as the mother of Jesus, as the Immaculate One, as the Mediatrix of all graces. So, be clear, you're not talking about competitive mediation. These are not rivals of mediation. You're talking about different levels of participation in mediation, which you and I also have to accept. That's why, my friends, I'm going to say it one more time. If you properly understand the role of the Blessed Mother, you know what you're supposed to be as a member of the church. And it's a powerful role, co-redemption, mediation, advocacy, a royal task. That's what we are as members of the body of Christ. We are all awaiting heavenly crowns because we're baptized into a royal priesthood, but not like her. She is unique. She's our model, as we're going to say. She's the perfect mother. So if you deny it about Mary, you're also denying it about us. And really, who's sad? Jesus is sad. Jesus is sad because he's the one who gave us his mother. He's the one who wants us to have the grace and blessing of helping someone make it to heaven. He's the one who wants us, as 1 Timothy 2.1 says, before the reference about there's one meteor, 1 Timothy 2.1 says, we're called to supplicate, to pray, to intercede one for another. We're called to do, that's mediation, my friends. Subordinate mediation in the one mediation of Jesus Christ. Well, 61 begins what I would see as, as, a, as a second climactic element in talking about Mary's role as a mediatrix. 61 uh, designates Mary's, once again, unique cooperation with Jesus in the work of redemption. And I tell you, if you had any question about the the, the teaching of the Second Vatican Council on co-redemption, you just have to look at the ink. There's so many different places where the fathers say, Mary with Jesus are uniquely cooperating in the work of redemption. It's always Jesus first in terms of foundation, in terms of what he does as God, as the God-man. But the unity is undeniable. Gibson got it right in the Passion. Two people understand what's happening. The mission of redemption. The son and the mother. And so here again, we'll read 60, Lumen Gentium 61. The predestination of the Blessed Virgin as Mother of God was associated with the incarnation of the Divine Word. In the designs of Divine Providence, she was the gracious Mother of the Divine Redeemer here on earth, and above all others, and in a singular way, the generous associate and humble, humble handmaid of the Lord. She conceived, brought forth, and nourished Christ. She presented him to the Father in the temple. She shared her son's sufferings as he died on the cross. Thus, in a holy, singular way, she cooperated by her obedience, faith, hope, and burning charity in the work of the Savior in restoring supernatural lives to souls. That's co-redemption. It's so very clear. And if the fathers repeat it, it's for a reason. They want us to get this down. And 61 ends with a important note. It says, for this reason, she is mother to us in the order of grace. What does that mean for this reason? No co-redemptrix, no mediatrix. No, no Eve in, in working with Jesus, the new Adam, in, in, in acquiring grace. No distribution of grace. And so for this reason, meaning because she uniquely works with Jesus in acquiring and obtaining the grace and winning the victory, therefore, and because of that, she becomes mother to us in the order of grace. Much more great stuff from the Council on Our Lady. Stay with us as we continue talking about the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Second Vatican Council. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli saying thanks for being with us at MaryCast. God bless you.